Dear Lord, our amazing, wonderful, awesome, great God in the universe who is completely available for us to be in your presence and come and connect with you on a very personal level. Lord, as a church this morning, we've, we've been able to collectively read the Bible together during the week that has gone. Uh, we've been reading Numbers, Luke, Psalms, Proverbs, and the book of Revelation. And as we have been reading in these books, we've learnt more about how you have been dealing with us as humans on this earth, which to us sometimes we feel far removed from you, but as we open up our minds to who you really are and what you are doing, we realise that you are deeply involved with us as humans. And so as we share this time together as a church family and, and we come together to look to you, to, to want to allow our, our lives and our hearts to be affected by you and changed. Lord, we are on a detour. This earth's journey is a detour from your plan. There's a lot of uh, challenge and trouble on this detour. So Lord, as we uh, just want to take this moment, we want to allow our, our mind's eye to practice looking at your face and being in your presence. So as we are here this morning, please let us see you in our mind's eye. Please may our hearts be completely open to the truly better life and the offer that you have for us, the original plan of true happiness and fulfilment that you have for us. Lord, uh, we just come and we accept that offer as we share this time this morning. Lord, I pray for Pastor Derek as he shares with us today. Your blessing is on him and we look forward to the message that uh, you'll be sharing through him today. Lord, we just praise you. You are our awesome God. We honour you and we look to you in this moment. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Questions without notice. Um, there's a lot I like about you, Candice. Um, so I want to acknowledge you in front of all these people for what you contribute to North Perth Church. I am a bit of a crybaby. Um, I think a lot of people have figured that out. Um, so coming here today, that song actually really touched me. And it's been wonderful to see you hiding from the corner to now leading out the microphone at the front. Um, I heard a rumour that you wrote one of the songs that we sing here at North Perth. That rumour is incorrect. Um, that, the song that I did write and will be singing is going to be next week at my baptism. This song, I, I'm nowhere skilled to write that no, song. No, not this song, but have you actually sung a song? Um, I mean, written a song that we've sung here at North Perth? No, no. Oh, I'll leave that one right through to the keeper. Um, tell us about your musical journey, Candice. Uh, I think my musical journey starts when I was little in front of the com um, not computer. Um, piano, I was quite reluctant to play piano. Um, and then a couple of times I came to church and went on the piano and then went back. And then um, I taught myself how to play guitar. Wow. Um, and then I went on the side over there. Yep. Um, still a bit nervous from time to time. And then I thought I'd give singing a crack. Um, so, yeah, I slowly moved from there to here. And now I'm here to here. So, um, yeah. But gradually. <laughs> the thing I loved about that song, I think the thing that got me about that song was um, all about how it's Christ working through us. And Candace, I see that in you. That there's, 
it's because you have those talents and you want to share those talents. It's not an ego thing, and I really appreciate that about you. Um, tell me about your special week next week, other than singing your own written song. Which I'll, yeah, tell me about what's going on next week. Next week I'm getting baptised. <laughs> and how are you feeling about it? Hmm? How are you feeling how do I about, feel about it? it? Um, not too nervous right now, and because I've been having like, practiced a few times singing up front. Um, but I'm sure it will kick in next week. I'll be shaking up here, giving my testimony and stuff. I'm oh, sure. We'll that's right, we've got you from there to there to yeah. here, yeah, and yeah, now yeah. You'll, be, you'll be fine. Candice, I want to ask uh, God for a blessing on you. Let's bow our heads as a congregation to support Candice. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the life of Candice. Thank you so much for the giftedness that you've been able to give her through music. That it's a blessing not just for herself, but she's able to share that blessing with us as a congregation. And I was moved this morning. Uh, thank you for her giftedness. And God, I just ask that you'll bless her, particularly through this week, in the lead up to her special day of the baptism. Bless her in a big way and a special way, I pray in your name. Amen. There's um, one more person I want to acknowledge today. I'm going to ask uh, Warren to come up the front. This is what our church looked like, I think about five days before the wedding of Matt and Carol. So luckily for the two of them, this is not the aisle that they had to walk down on this special day. And yet for the wedding, this is what it looked like. Warren did an exceptional amount of work behind the scenes to be able to give us what we have here. I'm not up here necessarily to acknowledge him for the hard work, though I think he needs to be acknowledged for it. But there's a story behind it that I would love for you to hear. So, Warren, firstly, uh, I don't know whether you want to drop figures, but, but tell us about the difference in the quotes for the different um, carpets that you went to, to see. The quotes varied from 13,750 to 31,000. So almost $20,000 difference in quotes. And the one that we've got here, the next nearest one to this, exactly the same carpet, was 6,250 dirham. Wow. Okay, so just there alone, Warren has saved us as a community six grand on the carpet. But I'll, there's a story behind it, Warren. Tell me about, tell me about the businessman who gave us that particular quote. Sure. Well, when the board asked me to get quotes for the carpet, I immediately thought of Don, who had been the guy, the carpet guy, who put the, uh, the flooring down on the youth room. Now, the youth will remember we had a lot of difficulty with that flooring, and it took quite a while to get it right. But Don looked after me, and because of all the inconvenience, he went to the supplier, who were the ones responsible for the misinformation, and got us a thousand dollars discount. So I thought I ought to go and see this guy again. I knew he was a Christian, so I went and saw him, and I told him what we needed, and obviously he needed to come and, and quote. He said, Warren, I'll look after you. And at this stage, he was calling me brother. So. When we got the quotes, I took them to the board and surprise, surprise, they accepted the lowest quote. <laughs> and so this is the end result. But when they accepted the quote, I rang Don and I said, Don, you'll be glad to know that our board has approved your quote. Warren, he said, I'm in hospital. Uh, you'll have to ring the manager and work it out with him. So I went to the manager and I told him that we'd, uh, the board had accepted the quote. And I said, what gives with Don? And he said, Don has got cancer. And uh, he's not doing very well. And then I spoke to the carpet layer. And he said, um, yeah, Don's not doing very well. And what intrigued me, this tells you about something about the guy. He said, I went and saw him in hospital last week. And the manager told me he'd also been to see him in hospital. They said he is the oldest carpet layer 
in Perth and not carpet layer, carpet professional. He was 86 last week. So I thought I ought to go and see this guy. So um, I went up to Fiona Stanley and I walked into the room there and there he was with his Bible. And so he was most touched that I'd come. We developed a relationship and I'd like to encourage you to look at business transactions more than just a financial thing. I spent over an hour with that guy. I know that because when I went to pay my parking meter, <laughs> I was into the second hour. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. He prayed and I prayed. We exchanged uh, our faith and our hope in Jesus. And I spoke to him actually this morning because I rang him during the week and I didn't get an answer. I rang this morning and I'm afraid the guy is not doing very well. But I just ask you to remember this guy in prayer. And I thank God that I was able to spend this quality time with him and encouraging him in his Christian walk. Warren, it's, it's one thing to acknowledge you for the work that you do behind the scenes for us as a community. But I think it shows your heart the fact that you make it not just about business transactions. That you took time out of your busy schedule to go the extra mile and to visit this guy in hospital and to be able to actually pray with him. So thank you, Warren, for all that you do, not just for us, but for people that you come into contact with. Let's pray for Warren. <laughs> Father God, I want to acknowledge uh, Warren and thank you for his giftedness and his tireless efforts at his age to continue on and do the extra miles for you. Uh, we thank you for Don, that he was willing to undercut us for um, what we do here as a church and to look out for us in that way. And God, we know that he's really struggling with his health at the moment. Give him a sense of peace that passes all understanding during this time and for him to know that there are people like Warren out there that are praying for him. Bless Warren, bless Kay, and continue to believe with them, I ask in your name. Amen. Thanks, Warren. Thank you, musicians. That was awesome. Good morning, everybody. My name's Derek, for those of you who haven't met me before. Here at North Perth Church, we are travelling through the Bible in a year, so our sermon will be based somewhere on these texts here. Uh, for those of you who are following along or are continuing to follow along or if you've fallen off the horse and you want to get back on board, these are the texts that we looked at this week. Numbers 26 through to Deuteronomy number 1, uh, Luke chapter 2 uh, through to 6, five chapters of the book of Psalms and a few verses from Proverbs. Now kids, for your sermon search, very important here. These are the ones you need to write down. A bit more difficult today because we're not just doing simple words. You are looking for how many times Pastor D uses these phrases throughout this presentation. The first one, lead yourself. The second one, choose positivity. The third one, think critically. And the fourth one, reject passivity. Give you a bit more time. It's worth the efforts. Even Pastor D is going to write down how many times he says these words so that he can score the prize at the end. Let me write them down again. Lead yourself. That's twice I've done it. Choose positivity. Twice. Think critically. Twice. Reject passivity. If you have your Bibles, I'd love you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. This is where we're going to start off today and then we're going to go for a bit of a joyride through the book of Numbers and the book of Luke. Warren, can you see those glasses there? They're my reading ones. They're going to be more helpful for me. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 1. You have stayed here long enough, God says, at this mountain. Break camp and advance. I have given you this land. So go in, take possession of the land that the Lord swore that he would give you to your fathers, 
to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and their descendants after them. God says, you have been wandering in this wilderness for long enough. You have learnt lessons from the past. Now it's time. The lessons that they learned were due to decisions that were made in their travels. This morning I want to cover this section of scripture based on what God was asking the Israelites to do. So let's bow our heads. Father, I just ask that whatever it is that you need us to hear, that we hear it from you direct. I pray in your name. Amen. Every year for the past, I don't know, 25 years, the Youth Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Conference runs what is called a summer camp. Kids by the ages of 10 all the way through to 15 go away for uh, four nights, five days to experience this summer camp journey. Some of you will understand what I mean by this by saying it's a great green code. A green code event is an event that is designed to help introduce people to Jesus. So while a good majority of the kids who would attend these summer camps have grown up in an Adventist home, not everybody was like that. There were some kids there who had barely opened a Bible or didn't even know about, much about Jesus who would come to these camps. And we would give them a really good time, you know, we would pull them along the back of boats, we would put them on horses, we would do water activities, we would do movie nights, we would have lots of fun and the kids just thought it was ace. But every night we would gather at a man-made little area and we would sing songs about Jesus and we would do dramas about Jesus and we would talk about Jesus and then we would pray together in cabins to Jesus. So no matter what level of spirituality you were at, there was always something about Jesus that was coming through. And every year you would have young people giving their hearts to Jesus saying, I want to learn more. This summer camp just passed was a hard one because my good friend, Pastor Willie, had just come back from a camporee, a Pathfinder camporee over east where 5,000 young people are getting together for a big event. He was pretty tired. And the first thing that you do with these summer camps is you have staff training to get the staff on board, to get them to understand, yes, we're here to give the kids a lot of fun, but that's not our sole purpose. The reason that we are here is to introduce young people to Jesus Christ. There was one particular person in this photo that I won't name or mention names, but when he arrived this year, he wasn't in a good headspace. He had what you call a chip on the old shoulder. He had an attitude problem. He, he was an angry young man, not necessarily wanting to be there for the right reasons. And every time that I've been to summer camp trainings with Willie, he has the same four principles that he wants to get across to his staff. You are here not for your own benefit. You are here for the benefit of the kids. You want to introduce the kids to Jesus. The four principles that he would go over and over comes from this book by Clay Scroggins called How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. The fourth principle is number one, lead yourself. Principle number, oh. <laughs> I've been, in my private reading this week, I've been spending a bit of time reading about um, Tiger Woods. One of the, if not the most prominent athlete of our generation, if not of all time. 
the effort that this guy would go to to execute the plan to become the best golfer of all time was phenomenal. And while he kept his eye on that goal, he was amazing at his golf. Principle number two. Choose positivity. Principle number three. Think critically. And principle number four, reject passivity. There were certain times where Pastor Willie and this staff camp, um, camp staffer were clashing. Willie was trying to get across the importance of why we do the things that we do and the way that we do things at summer camp. And it, wasn't, it just didn't seem to be sinking in. And Willie would bring up those four points and just hammer it home. These are the four things. At the end of the summer camp, we have a, a staff exit interview. We have been able to observe you over the past week. Here's the areas that we think you did sensational. Here's the areas that we would like to see improvement in and we would like to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So Willie shared, these are the things that we saw growth in you. Here's some of the areas or challenges that we faced with you. And he acknowledged it. And then just before the prayer of blessing, he piped up and he said, Willie, with what you've taught me over this week and the principles that I've learned and the joy that I've seen in the kids' faces and learning that it's not about me being the staff, but it's about them being the kids. I've had a transformation, and I think I would like to dedicate my life to being a pastor. He's now currently in Avondale. With those four principles, going through the readings from this week, I saw patterns. And so I want to share the patterns with you, whether you can see the dots joined or not. I saw the dots joined, and I want to share it with you. So taking in consideration the Deuteronomy number one, and taking in consideration I've already told you about the, the, tiger, <laughs> the tiger story. Have, Clay says that leading yourself is all about creating an oasis of excellence. And that's when Tiger was all about the golf, that's what he wanted to achieve in his life. An oasis of excellence to be the best golfer that he could be. Jesus says to his disciples and to us generations further down, guys, girls, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other stuff that are as important will come your way. But you want to create that, that oasis of excellence. What Cliff was talking about last week, seeking the presence to seek first the kingdom of God. Principle number two. There is a difference between a victim question and an abundance question. A victim question asks, how can I possibly lead when I don't even have the authority that I need? The abundance question says, how should I lead with the authority that I already have? 99. Point 5% of us in this room probably have somebody that we are answerable to in some way. Whether it's a boss at work, whether it's your wife at home, <laughs> we all got someone that we are responsible to. 
And sometimes we can go, well, I would do things differently if I was the boss. I would be able to do things differently if I had the authority. Leading yourself is all about, with the authority that I already have, what influence can I have? Johnny Maxwell says that leadership is nothing but influence. Nothing more, nothing less. If you're still in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, starting verse 9, it talks about the appointment of leaders for the Israelites as they were about to go into this land that God had promised them, finally. At that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. The Lord your God has increased your number so that today you are as numerous as the stars in the sky. Drop down to verse 13. So choose some wise understanding and respected men from each of your tribes and I will set them over you. Whether it's groups of 10 or whether it's groups of 50 or 100, if these people are wise, understanding and respected in their own lives, then they have a better chance of leading groups of 10. And if they seem to be good at being wise and understanding and respected with groups of 10, then trust them with groups of 50 and on and on it goes. But the important thing is that you need to be able to lead yourself in order to be effective in leading others. So have a look at the triangle. How am I going leading myself in the reaching up? How am I going in myself with the reaching in? Those are relationships that are important to me in my life, in my network. And how am I going in the relationships with people outside of my network? Principle number two. Choose positivity. Your attitude will determine your altitude. In verse 21, see, the Lord your God has given you the land. So go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors told you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. As you take this land, these are the two things that you're not to do. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. The two biggest demons that we need to fight in our lives are fear and guilt. When we tie those things to the way that we live our lives, it distorts. So God says, as you are taking what I have already promised, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Think critically. There is a difference between thinking critically and critical thinking. Critical thinking is problem-based. I can see the problems. Therefore, I will talk about them ad nauseum because that's what I see. Thinking critically is solution-based. I can see where there's issues, but I know a solution that will help. What God is after is looking for solutions rather than the problems. Issue identification does not move things forward. There are some of us that are really good at noticing things. There are some of us that are really good at questioning things. There's some of us that are really good at connecting the dots I see this and wouldn't our church be better if we could go that way? Or I see this and wouldn't our worship service be so much better if we could do A, B or C? There are some of us that are very good at picking those things up. It's almost a gift. But don't leave it to thinking critically. I mean, thinking critical, there's a difference. Thinking critically is different. And so in verses 26 through to 28... But you were unwilling to go up, God says. Verse 27, you stayed in your tents and you grumbled. The Lord hates us, so he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. And they say the people are stronger and they're taller than what we are. Their cities are large and look at the walls that go all the way up to the sky. 
They were unwilling, they grumbled, and they did not take the Lord's advice to do not be afraid or do not be terrified. And then reject passivity talks about that when you're not in charge, sometimes you can settle for doing less than what you're capable of doing. Don't do it. Put yourself out there, be solution focused and do what you can to go the extra mile to make things better rather than to let things falter. In verses 29 through to 33, I'll start, oh, 31 I think. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until he reached this place. I want you to know that I've been with you the whole journey so far. I'm going to see you the whole way. Just stick with me. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you in the camp and to show the way that you should go. Reject passivity. So in our readings this week, those four principles came up in the book of Numbers with what was going on before God said, it's time, let's take the promised land. Lead yourself. In Numbers chapter 27, God says to Moses, because there was that hiccup with the water at the rock, I'm not going to be able to let you go to the promised land like I promised. Because if I let you go, then it shows favouritism to all the other people who have tried their best as well. But be heartened because you will see the glory of God. But in the meantime, I want you to take Joshua, who has verse 17, oh, sorry, verse 18. Joshua, who has the spirit of leadership, lay your hands on him and allow him to take you through the journey. Joshua was able to lead himself when everybody else was saying, we can't go into the promised land, they're too big, they're too strong, we'll get annihilated. Joshua was one of only two people out of the 601,000 at that time who said, I think we can do it. He was able to lead himself. Thinking critically, verses 3 to 7 of chapters number 27, there's a guy by the name of Zaph, uh, fell of Had, Fad, 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 who had daughters and no sons. And the daughters came up to Moses and said, there's an issue here. Just because our dad didn't have any sons, why does that mean that we aren't able to take possession of the land when he's gone? Moses hadn't thought of that through. Took it to the Lord and the Lord said, she's got a point. It's not about your gender, it's about looking after your clan. And if this guy has had no one but daughters, then they deserve the inheritance. And so they changed the law in order to make that happen. Now, those ladies could very well have been critical thinkers and grumbled in their tents about how sexist it was out in the wilderness that they weren't getting the inheritance of their father just because they were women. But they didn't. They saw a problem, they brought a solution, and the laws were changed as a result. Reject passivity. In Numbers chapter 31, you've got a tough teaching. Uh, Numbers 31, I'm going to start verse 15. Have you allowed, Moses said, all the women to live? They were the ones who were following Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in that Peah incident. So that a plague struck the Lord's people. Now, you need to wipe out the boys and you need to wipe out the women, all the women that have at least slept with a man, but save yourselves the girls who haven't. This is a hard teaching. 
If you go a couple of chapters after, in 3355, God's clear. He's saying, if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you who allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you will live. And then I will do what I have to plan to do to them. God is saying, I don't want to get to the point where we were in Noah's time, where there was only one family who stood up for what I believed and what I wanted. Just the one family. I got so frustrated. If it wasn't for that one family, humankind would have been wiped out. I don't want to get to that point. And what seems to be happening, Israelites, is every time you allow some of these other foreigners to come in, it changes your culture. You're not changing them, they're changing you. So this one incident with the Balaam, where Balaam came and as a man of God was starting to curse, all of a sudden there's a plague breaking out. And there was these, this couple, a him and a her, can't remember their names, but it is mentioned in scripture. A him and a her who ha wanted to have their own, but they just didn't do it in the, in the quietness of their own tent. They went in front of Moses, they went in front of the people almost to flaunt that we can do whatever we want. And God says when you allow that spirit into a community, it not only changes them, it changes the community. Don't think for one moment that your private sins is just between you and God. When there's a breakage between your relationship with God, it not only affects you, it affects your community, your tribe, your family, your church family, people that you come into contact with as you go about your day-to-day -day activities and work. God says we can't have that. They can't be the thorn in our sides. They can't be the barbs in their eyes. And so Phineas, when he sees these two and what they're up to, says this isn't good enough and gets the spear and wipes them out. Now, don't for one moment say oh, I'm up here advocating that we get our spears and if we see someone doing the wrong thing, we go and like spear them. But there is scripture that bases and says if you see your brother or sister wandering in a different direction to what you know God would appreciate, you need to tip them, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I've noticed this about you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to pull you up to see if everything's okay. Phineas rejected passivity. He knew what those were up to, he knew that it was wrong, and he decided to do something about it. And then choose positivity. In Numbers 32, you've got verses 5 to 9. This is about the Transjordan tribes. So 5 to 9. These two tribes... Come up to Moses and say, Moses, we love this area where we are at the moment. And if we've found favour in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Don't make us cross into the Jordan. Don't make us follow the other ten tribes to try and take over the promised land. Moses said to those two tribes, should your fellow Israelites or should your friends or should your neighbours go to war while you sit here and do nothing? Why do you discourage the Israelites from crossing over into the land that the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh. And after they went into that valley and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land that the Lord had given. And now you are doing the exact same thing as what those ten spies were doing. They went back and they had a bit of a think about it. And to their credit, when they come back in verse, I think, 16, they say, Moses, we would still like to keep safe our women and our kids, but we as men, we will go and fight. 
we will be with our brothers, we will be with our neighbours to do what is right in conquering the promised land. Choose positivity. Say no to the fear, say no to the guilt, say God has given us this promise, we need to go for it. So that was the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament you've got the story of Jesus as a 12 year old who was accidentally left behind by mum and dad for three days before they finally realised and got back and found where he was. If that's ever happened to you, there's a parenting seminar that's happening in this building next week, next afternoon, and I would encourage you to go and attend something like that because we don't want that happening very much. But Jesus' mum and dad, they, they made a mistake, right? So they come back. Jesus, it says in Luke chapter 2, led himself. It talks in Luke chapter 2, not just once, but twice, about how Jesus grew. Jesus might have been born perfect, but he still managed to grow. The child grew, verse 40 and verse 52, the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Verse 52, he grew in wisdom, in stature, in favour with God and in favour with people. In other words, he grew mentally, he grew physically, he grew socially and he grew spiritually. If Jesus was all about growing, we too should act to grow. Jesus knew how to lead himself. In choosing positivity, despite the fact that Jesus shut her down when she said, how could you, how dare you stay here when we had already left, Jesus says, I know what I was here for. I was here to do my father's business. It says, rather than Mary harbouring a grudge, she held to her heart the promise that Jesus could be the chosen one because of his actions in choosing positivity. Thinking critically, in the temple courts, verses 46 and verses 47, after three days, Mary and Joseph found Jesus in the temple courts doing three things. He was sitting amongst the teachers, he was listening to them, and he was asking questions. And it left people who saw him and hearing him amazed at his understanding of his answers. And Jesus rejected passivity when confronted about why it was that he had let mum and dad go without him, he stood up for himself and said, you know what, I'm here to do my father's business. Both Old Testament and New Testament had elements of all four principles. Leading yourself, even if you're not in charge. Choose positivity even when things aren't going your way. Think critically rather than be a critical thinker. By all means, find areas that could be improved, but be solution-based rather than problem-based. And finally, reject passivity. Go for that excellence. Go for using your giftedness to build God's kingdom in whatever capacity that is. So whether you consider your personal life, your professional life, or more importantly, your spiritual life, take into account these four principles. For our benediction today, I want to read through one of the Psalms that was in our Bible reading. So if you bow your heads, it says, You, God, are our God. We earnestly seek you. We thirst for you. Our whole being longs for you. We feel like we are dry and parched where there is no water. But verse 2 says, We have seen you in this sanctuary and have beheld your power and your glory. So be with us as we leave for this week. In your name, amen. <laughs>